Okay then, comrades. Well, every time I'm trying to prove the point that bourgeois democracy is just a dictatorship of the rich, I typically will use lots of examples from different points in history and different places around the world, like Macron or Thatcher. There's, all, there's, a, there's a huge number of examples that you can use. But today, I think it's only really necessary to discuss what's going on right now around Israel and Palestine. Because we can start, for example, with the, the policy towards that conflict of the nice democratic British state, which is obviously to offer total support to Israel as it tramples all over human rights and commits war crimes and breaks international law. Obviously, that doesn't seem very democratic. And yet the democratic British state is supporting that fully. Is that the democratic will of the majority of people in the UK today? If you put that policy to a vote, the policy that, that the, the, the British state should support Israel, would it, would it be voted in favour of? Well, there was a poll on the 27th of October, so not long ago, what's that, two weeks ago, um, <clears throat> in which just 13%, they were, the question was asked directly, and just 13% of people said, yes, the UK should support Israel in this conflict. The majority said that the UK should be neutral or not involved at all. And yet that majority opinion, in what way is that reflected in the politics and in the media, we'll come to the media in a minute, but in the politics, in the media of this country, it's not reflected at all. Now, obviously we live in a democracy, so if we don't like government policy, if we think that the government is not reflecting the, the majority will of the people, we can always kick them out, replace them with a different government. <coughs> But if we elect the opposition in this country, will Britain's policy towards Israel change? Obviously not. He said that himself. Keir Starmer has said himself uh, that his policy is identical to the Tories on this. So I think we're entitled to ask, what kind of democracy is this that we live in, which gives us no control whatsoever over government foreign policy? But I think we'd also be entitled to ask the same thing of more or less any bourgeois state at any time anywhere in the world. Is there anywhere where foreign policy is actually conducted openly and subject to proper democratic scrutiny? Are all the secret treaties that are done, the, the military agreements that are signed between different states, are they ever put before the public and discussed openly? The, the aims of such uh, policies, obviously not. So if it's not majority opinion of the population that drives foreign policy decisions, what is it? in a democratic, in a nice democratic country like Britain. Well, if we take this specific case of Britain's policy towards Israel, in 2021, the UK government elevated its, its relationship with the Israeli state from a bilateral relationship to a strategic partnership, which is a, it basically just means that they're going to do a lot more business with them. Because annual bilateral trade between the UK and Israel now exceeds five billion pounds. Over the last 10 years, that trade has increased by 73%. There are over 300 Israeli companies operating in the UK. And, uh, and the UK Israel, there's something called the UK Israel Tech Hub. They, they particularly, for those 300 companies, a lot of them are tech companies. The UK Israel uh, economic relationship is based around tech. And that's brought about 1.2 billion pounds to the UK economy. On top of that, there's a, what is it called? The, a Britain Israel Investment Group whose aim, whose stated aim is to, is to launch new tech innovation projects in the region around Israel, in the Middle East and, uh, and Southeast Asia. It's imperialism basically, it's an imperialist uh, project, uh, a joint venture between Britain and Israel. The point is there's a lot of money flowing between Britain and Israel. And that is the deciding factor about Britain's foreign policy towards Israel. It is nothing to do at all with human rights or international law uh, or, or public opinion, certainly, or anything like this. So the driving force uh, is the capitalist class and, and British imperialists who want to preserve their financial interests, whether that's in Israel or any other country. You could pick any country around the world and it would be the same. And use that relationship as a launch pad for further investments in other countries in the region and so on. Who does the capitalist class... So that's who decides. It's the capitalist class. It's the, it's the rich people. It's the people with the money, the imperialists. Who do they get to implement those policies? They don't implement them, so it's not the bosses themselves literally running government policy. Who do they get them? Who do they get to, to implement this policy? Well, you might think that it's the democratically elected or so-called democratically elected government. We'll come on to the extent to which they are actually democratically elected in a moment. You might think specifically it's the foreign minister of 
the UK government, who at the moment is a guy called um, James Cleverly, a Tory. But, uh, but in reality, of course, that's not the case. Governments can be unpredictable things, especially at the moment in Britain. You can have a rapid change of, of personnel, you can have a rapid change of parties. Things can move very, very quickly. And for, if you're a capitalist, that's not a very stable situation to be in. You, you don't want to build a relationship with a foreign minister who then, because of internal political wrangling, gets pushed aside and someone else comes in and all of a sudden you have to build a new relationship to preserve your interests. That's not an efficient way for the capitalists to, to operate. They need something a little bit more stable. And so the head of the diplomatic service in Britain, which is obviously responsible for defending UK interests overseas, is not the foreign minister. That's not his job. He's not the head of the diplomatic service. Head of the diplomatic service is the permanent secretary to the foreign office, a guy at the moment called Sir Philip Barton. He is a civil servant. He's unelected. And, uh, and he is fully built and owned and operated by the, the British ruling class. I'll explain what I mean by that. Every, every permanent secretary to the Foreign Office in history, every single one, going back as far as I could find uh, the names, with just maybe one or two exceptions, all of them went to just two universities, Oxford and Cambridge which obviously are the elite institutions that train the representatives and train the, the operatives of the British ruling class. More than that, when it comes to the, the civil service, when it comes to the foreign office, uh, not the political side, but the unelected side, you, to, to get to the top of the foreign office, you have to go in at the bottom. You have to go in straight out of university, uh, age 21, and you spend your life in that institution. That's the only way to get to the top. They don't hire, oh, the, whole, um, the whole civil service is fairly closed off when it, when it comes to hiring from the outside. They prefer their own people to come up from the bottom. That is overwhelming, that's even more the case in the foreign office than anywhere else. They will not hire from outside. At a real push, they might hire someone from another government department to come into the top of the foreign office. But that is as far as they will go. They will not have anybody from outside the civil service come in. And, uh, and run the foreign office. It's extremely closed off. People are brought up in that and educated and trained and saturated with the ideas and the outlook of, uh, of these representatives of British capitalist interests, British imperialist interests. Every member of the diplomatic service in this country is what they call a crown servant. I've been referring to them as civil servants. They're actually crown servants and there is a difference. Although no one will be able to tell you exactly what that difference is. It's not written down anywhere. It's not quite clear. What is clear is they swear their loyalty to the monarchy. They're like the army in that respect, actually. They don't swear their loyalty to the government, like other civil servants might be employed by the government. So the diplomats, they swear their loyalty to the crown, uh, which is obviously unelected as well. <clears throat> every permanent secretary that has ever been, every permanent secretary to the Foreign Office, and more or less every permanent secretary to every government department, actually, because that every government department has, a, has the minister, the 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 bauble, the elected uh, person, and then it has a permanent secretary uh, who really runs things. Every permanent secretary to the Foreign Office uh, that there has ever been has received a knighthood. Um, <clears throat> and most of them, the overwhelming majority of them, they all become lords when they retire. They're all made into lords as long as they do what they're told. But this is what's dangled in front of them as they spend their lives in the Foreign Office. Do as you're told, represent our interests, and we'll make you a knight and we'll make you a lord at the end of it. These people are bred for this role. They're saturated with the outlook, ambitions, and lifestyle of the ruling class. They're, they're surrounded by it and directly accountable to the ruling class. There is not one shred of democracy to be found here. This is unambiguously the machinery of a dictatorship of the rich to ensure its interests are the ones which carry out British foreign policy. Now, maybe we don't need to worry about this because our democracy affords us the right to disagree uh, through things like freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Yeah, but is that really the case? Because in Oxford, we have a comrade who put a resolution uh, recently calling for solidarity with Palestine and for a revolutionary solution to the conflict in Gaza. And the, the so-called free media went ballistic about that and they called for the debate to be shut down. The university intervened the university management intervened and told the trade union, the UCU, that it was not allowed to even discuss that motion. And anyone who did discuss it would be sacked. 
So that's your freedom of speech. So much for freedom of speech. In Newcastle, in UCL, in London, universities have cancelled our events to stop us discussing about solidarity with Palestine. And even this venue that we're in today told us what we could and couldn't say about this question. They put certain restrictions on. So, so much for freedom of assembly, so much for the right to gather and talk about whatever you like. And this obviously is not to mention the barefaced lies and distortions by the media about the Israeli genocide, nor the, the kind of frenzied attempts of the government to ban marches, for example, around the question. Where are the freedoms of speech and assembly here? Clearly, you only have freedom of speech as long as the rich people who own the media agree with what you have to say. That's the point. You only have freedom of association, freedom of assembly, as long as the rich people who own the venues agree with what you're having meetings about. But obviously, the people who own the newspapers and the venues are the same people with imperialist interests in supporting Israel. I'll give you one example of that. Rupert Murdoch has a 5.5% stake in a company called Genie Oil and Gas, which has conducted shale gas and oil exploration in the Golan Heights, which is Palestinian land occupied by Israel. Do you think his newspapers are more likely to represent Israeli or Palestinian interests as a result of that? So what are these democratic rights that we are supposed to have? What are they actually worth when the system strips working class people of the means to exercise them? Obviously, these rights, they're not just theoretical. In a democracy, they're enshrined in the law. But this is the point. The law, when it treats everybody equally in a system which is unequal, then all you're doing is embedding that inequality, is justifying that inequality. That's all the law is good for. And if you want to know how much the Western democracies really care about uh, democracy and the rule of law, have a look at what they were saying about the Netanyahu regime in Israel just earlier this year. Because Netanyahu was passing policies and deliberately attempting to undermine the judiciary, make it less independent and, and give more power to, to the government in Israel to overrule the judges. And the West was sharply criticizing him. Western leaders, were sharp, including Biden, were, were criticizing Netanyahu for that. They were issuing very stark warnings saying, you are undermining the rule of law. They obviously don't actually care about the rule of law. They, they don't care at all. What they're worried about is their investment possibilities in, in Israel here. But they framed it in terms of the rule of law. They said, we're democracies and we care a lot about the rule of law. And Netanyahu, you've got to stop doing that. Now, there's a much broader threat to their interest in the region. They turn 180 degrees and say, actually, do you know what? Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. And therefore, we're going to back it all the way. Netanyahu is doing a great job and so on. Um, <clears throat> that is how much democracy and the rule of law actually means to the imperialists. They discard it. As soon as a struggle breaks out that threatens their fundamental interests, they drop any pretense of worrying about this kind of thing and, uh, and bare their teeth, uh, as they have many times throughout history, which I'm sure some comrades can, can come in on if they have examples. Now, of course, the rule of law doesn't enforce itself. That's what the police is for. And we're told the police is a key pillar of any uh, democracy because it maintains order. Uh, in the US, for example, um, the, the slogan of the police is to protect and serve. It's presented as, the police is presented as part of the community, as just helping everybody out, this neutral arbiter that exists to just um, simmer, simmer everything down, just calm all the tensions down, be a neutral force in society. And they do preserve order, but they preserve a particular kind of order. This is what we have to understand. They don't preserve order that actually matters to working class people. They preserve the order that matters to the ruling class, the capitalist class. And I give you some figures to illustrate this. In the last year in England and Wales, 75% of burglaries went uninvestigated. Burglary is obviously something that affects working class people. It's not rich people's houses that are getting burgled because they've got lots of security and walls and gates and fences and so on. 75% didn't get investigated. In the last year, just 2.5% of rape complaints resulted in an arrest and the and the prosecution rate, the conviction rate, obviously was even lower than that. I would say anybody who has dealt with the police lately in any way will, will realize that they are, they are more or less incapable at the moment of actually carrying out the job that, that ordinary people would want from the police in the sense of preserving order, investigating burglaries, keeping them safe and so on from, from criminal elements. 
they are not able to do these things, partly because of years of Tory cuts and everything else, but they're, they're not capable of, of carrying out that role, preserving that kind of order. The kind of order they are capable of preserving is to provide thousands of police officers to police uh, peaceful pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Just the other week, the police came out and said, what we're going to do is dedicate more resources to, to uh, schools. Uh, because kids are talking about Palestine in a way that we don't really like. So we're going to dedicate more police resources to checking what kids are saying about Palestine in school. That's the, that's the kind of order that they're trying to preserve. When our comrades were in the police station just recently, they said it was really illuminating because people were coming in and asking for help with various things. They were coming to the police, going up to the desk, saying, will you help me with this or that or whatever? And the officer behind the desk kept saying the same thing over and over again. The comrade said, I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she sat there all day with a straight face. And, just, and all these people asking for help, she just kept saying, sorry, we don't have officers for that. We, don't, we can't do it. There's nothing we can do about that. We can't send anyone to help. Meanwhile, our comrades had been hauled in for, for doing absolutely nothing. And they were kept there all day. Five different officers dealt with them. They were calling central office to work out what to do. That's where the police resources were going. Meanwhile, people were coming and asking for it. That's the kind of order that the police actually preserves. Obviously, partly this is the result, especially lately, of political pressure from the government. The police is putting resources into that and not other things. But, uh, but it's not just a case of that. The police is institutionally a weapon of the ruling class, just as much as the diplomatic service, which I was talking about earlier. Because like the diplomatic service, the police are run by completely unelected officials. Even the Home Secretary, the politician, Suella Braverman, can't control what they do, as we've been seeing lately, actually. If it was up to her, they'd be on a, on a mad one arresting 300,000 people in central London. Um, but she can't do that. And that's an interesting split in the ruling class, by the way, about how to use the police and how to deal with these protests. Um, the police is, is almost being painted as if it's on the side of the protesters. Uh, that's clearly not the case. There's a split here about do we use the police to repress or do we hold back? Because if they did, what well, one side, Suella Braverman's saying just arrest a lot of them. And uh, the commissioner of the Met Police is saying, if you do that, you're going to provoke a riot. So it's not a question of the police being on the side of the protest. It's a question of trying to work out what's the best way to try and calm the situation down. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but that's a slightly separate point. The permanent secretary, the, the civil service bloke who's responsible for uh, the Home Office, it's a similar situation to the Foreign Office. Every single one of them, going back as far as you can find, all of them went to those same two universities, Oxford, with one exception. Uh, someone, one of them went to Edinburgh University, but apart from that, they all went to Oxbridge. All of them are knights, and two of them are dames, because there have been two women. Um, <clears throat> but it's the exact same setup. They're bred for those roles. They're saturated with the ideas and outlook of the ruling class. Those are the people, the Home Office permanent secretaries, they're the ones who run the police. The bedrock of policing in the UK, uh, the, the basic idea of it is, is an idea of community policing. Uh, which is the idea that officers are just, police officers are just ordinary people. They're ordinary members of your community. Uh, and, uh, and they just want to help out. That's all. They're just, they're just, they're just nice guys who just want to help, help us all out. Uh, and that, that image of the police is really crucial to any democratic legitimacy they might try and claim. In reality, of course, the police spend their time enforcing laws directed against the working class. They do stand, they're forced to stand separate uh, and... Uh, and apart from ordinary people, and therefore are increasingly seen as, in the last few years especially, increasingly seen as separate from, uh, from the workers and, and a weapon, clearly a weapon of the ruling class. And that feeling, by the way, it's felt by the police, it's a fact also, that is what leads to the institutional racism and misogyny, all these ideas that come from the ruling class then saturate this organisation. Uh, this institution of the police. And in the most extreme cases, obviously what that creates is this feeling that they are, they are above the law. They have to be above the law because they have to be the ones that enforce it. And so you get in the most extreme cases, police officers who, who have been convicted of raping and killing members of the public whilst being police officers. Um, <clears throat> what is remotely democratic about this institution? The police is, is, is presented as a pillar of a democracy. And yet there is, there is nothing democratic about it at all. Now, throughout the atrocities being committed by Israel lately, we've had Rishi Sunak making statements on behalf of Britain, visiting Netanyahu on behalf of Britain. And why is he doing that? Because he's the Prime Minister. Why is Rishi Sunak the Prime Minister? Because he initiated a coup against Boris Johnson within the Tory party. He, tri <laughs> he triggered resignations of ministers. He coordinated attacks on Boris Johnson by civil servants in the press. 
After Johnson's resignation, Sunak stood to be the leader of the Tory party and thereby automatically becoming prime minister. The electorate from in, that, in that election was 160,000 people, that's all. 160,000 members of the Tory party, real, real nutcases and very unrepresentative, white, old, uh, middle class. Sunak, nevertheless, was not mad enough for those people and he lost that election. He couldn't even win uh, an election of 160,000 uh, nutters. Liz Truss became the prime minister instead. She was not to the liking of a huge swathe of the establishment in the UK and this kind of unholy alliance of pension funds and big investment funds, the Bank of England, the Office for Budgetary Responsibility, the Civil Service, none of those people are elected in any way and yet they all work together to bring down Liz, Tr Liz Truss uh, within a matter of days. And then Sunak, having just lost the vote in the Tory party, Sunak then became the prime minister because no one else stood against him. So he was just crowned basically as prime minister after that. Where is the democracy and all of that? How, do, how, come, how does this man claim any democratic legitimacy to represent uh, people in Britain? It's an absolute joke. Who does he answer to? He answers to the people who put him in power. All those unelected bodies, all those unelected officials. Uh, and, and to a very limited extent, some bits of the Tory party. Certainly, he does not answer to uh, the British working class. What clearer example do you need that it's these unelected people representing the rich, it's the bankers, it's the pension funds, the big investment funds. Those are the people that got Sunak into power, very literally put him into power. What more evidence do you need that the rich and powerful get more votes than the rest of us. And, uh, and there's many other examples of that, which I'm not going to go into because of time, but uh, questions like lobbying, for example, gifts to MPs. All of this is transparently the rich, uh, the rich uh, taking votes, basically, or, or gaining votes, gaining more votes than the rest <coughs> of us. I'll give you one example. Since Sunak has been prime minister, uh, what is the figure here? Uh, I can't see it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It, it's approximately 10 people, 10 individuals, have contributed 84% of all the donations to the Tory party since Sunak has been prime minister. And that amounts to, it's just it's like 12 and a half million pounds or something like that. If, if one of those 10 people has something to say about government policy, do you think Sunak is gonna listen to them or is he gonna listen to you who writes a letter to your MP about your opinions? The rich have far more sway, far more votes, far more influence. Um, and, and donations, lobbying, gifts to MPs, gifts to, to the, the ruling party, uh, second jobs for MPs, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I could go into, I've got lots of detail here, but, uh, but I don't really have time. But as well as those very direct methods of, uh, it is just open bribery, and it's accepted, but it's, it's just open bribery of, of political representatives by the rich. There's also more indirect methods of, of corrupting and of controlling the political representatives. And it's the same as what they do with the civil service. 90% of people in Britain attend comprehensive secondary schools, just normal schools. Only 50% of MPs attend those schools and the other 50% have attended elite schools, uh, private schools, boarding schools, uh, where again, they are saturated with trained, educated and outlook of the ruling class. There's these more subtle indirect methods, more like kind of indoctrination from a young age of, of, the, uh, of the people, of the future representatives of the ruling class. So there's direct methods of bribery, there's indirect methods of indoctrination. There's many more examples that could be given of the sham that is British democracy. We could talk about the military, for example, being deployed in the Middle East to help, explicitly to help Israel against Palestine, to help the oppressor against the oppressed. Like the diplomatic service, the military swears its loyalty to the uh, unelected monarchy and not the government, and much less the people of the UK. And as with elsewhere, actually, the leaders of the army are raised in, in that same outlook um, <clears throat> through the elite institutions and privileged backgrounds. I looked up every, every living general of the British army, uh, like every, everyone who's currently alive now, every single one of them, again, with maybe one or two exceptions, attended uh, private boarding schools in Britain. There's a tiny, tiny number of schools that they all, all of them uh, went to because they're educated, they're, they're raised for those, uh, for those roles. There are, there, are other, there are plenty of other examples, but the point is this. This is what British democracy looks like. Armed men standing guard whilst the unelected government and the unelected civil service facilitate a massacre and the law and human rights and the police. Not only do they not do anything about it, they actively work 
and are structured to prevent any real opposition to that. And all of this is done on behalf of the richest people in society. So I would say that the last few weeks have exposed more clearly than any kind of theory ever could that bourgeois democracy is just a dictatorship of the rich. Now the important thing for us to realize is that this isn't, this isn't the system gone wrong. This is exactly how it's supposed to work. The ruling class in any society throughout all of history, the ruling class has always controlled the state. The state is often presented as standing above society, as a kind of neutral arbiter between different tendencies uh, and different sections, but in reality it has always been a weapon of the ruling class. Sometimes the ruling class has run its apparatus through a, an open dictatorship, and sometimes it runs it through a democracy. For dictatorship, questions around dictatorship, how it arises, when and why it's useful to the ruling class, you'd have to see last year's talk at the Revfest on Bonapartism, or read the article in the theoretical magazine, we're dealing with uh, democracy today. Where the ruling class has used democracy throughout history, it has always been democracy of that particular class. So in ancient Roman Athens, they ran their state through democracy, but it was democracy of the slave owners and not the slaves. In, uh, in 1215, the year 1215 in, in Britain, um, Magna Carta was signed and Magna Carta was, uh, was, was the introduction of some democracy into the feudal system. It gave rights to 25 lords and barons, rights to basically control some of what the king was doing, raising taxes and setting up an army and stuff like that. There was an element of democracy introduced into the feudal system. It was democracy for a very narrow layer, democracy for the lords, for the barons, and not obviously for the serfs and everybody else. The early democratic republics in Florence and Venice, they also had an element of democracy. But it was democracy very explicitly for the bourgeois. Everybody else was excluded from that. The point is this, there is no such thing as abstract democracy. Liberals talk about abstract democracy. They talk about democracy in general. Isn't democracy a good thing? Marxists always ask democracy for which class? That's the crucial question for us. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels say that the modern democratic state is just a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. And that committee is made up of permanent secretaries, generals, judges, police chiefs, Bank of England economists, press barons, MPs, and so on. It's not, it's not a literal committee, obviously. They don't all meet together and, and discuss how to run the state. But it's the establishment, and it's shaped by a common worldview that's, that's imbued within them from their upbringing and from their, from their education that's explicitly uh, coordinated through bribery and everything else. Through the direct corruption, indirect indoctrination, this is how that committee is, it functions, basically. Now, what is the point of all this? Why does the capitalist class need a committee to manage its affairs in the first place? Why can't the, why can't the rich all just get together, uh, the big industrialists and bankers and so on? Why don't they run their affairs uh, directly and openly themselves? What is the point of the state? Well, to put it succinctly, in the words of Lenin, he said, it is impossible to compel the greater part of society to, to, to work systematically for the other part of society without a permanent apparatus of coercion. And that's what the state in any given society actually is, is a permanent apparatus of coercion designed to maintain the wealth and power of the ruling class. The bankers don't run their own armies and police. They need a state to do that. That's the point of the state. That apparatus of coercion takes the form of, yeah, of the... Uh, of the army, for example, to protect the interests of the oppressors and the imperialists against the oppressed. It takes the form of the police and prisons to enforce laws which protect the private property of the rich and, uh, and preserve order in, so that they're able to carry out their, their interests. It takes the form of judges and a legal system which protects the right to private property but not the right to things like healthcare and housing. Um, <clears throat> And then obviously the state does have softer edges as well. The essence of it is that, so those armed bodies of men, but then there's the softer, more ideological kind of edges to the state, like media, uh, education, religion, all of which exist to justify the, uh, the world, promote the interest, justify the worldview, the philosophy of the bourgeoisie. But the essence of the state, as I say, is that permanent apparatus of coercion. It's the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. That's what the state has and preserves very, guards very jealously. And it's armed bodies of men. And then obviously there are appendages to those 
to those bodies, right? You need, if you're going to run a police and a military and courts and prisons and everything else, you need money to do so. And therefore, you need a treasury, you need people who can collect taxes. You also need, in order to, in, in the face of class struggle over the course of, of hundreds of years, you need, you, the, the state will be forced to grant certain concessions to the workers in order to preserve its legitimacy and justify why it is allowed to have that monopoly on violence. And so you will start to see things like healthcare, for example, and, and social uh, services and, and uh, um, pensions and things like that, all also run by the state as concessions to the working class. So the state begins to sprawl outwards like that in order to justify, all of it is to justify the existence of those armed bodies of men. But the crucial thing to understand and to remember is that none of these state institutions or the concepts that surround the state, even the idea of a state at all, and then things like democracy as a way of running the state or the rule of law, none of these things, or even the concept of justice, all these very abstract liberal uh, conceptions, none of them exist without a class content, and none of them exist independently in any way. None of them have any kind of independent history. It's not like you have society, and over here you have the concept of democracy, and our job, this is what liberals would say, our job is just to try and take this concept and, and bash it into society as much as possible. And whenever society veers off, try and drag it back towards this abstract concept that exists over here of democracy or justice or whatever else. There is no independent history of democracy, the rule of law or anything like this. They are all tied up with the development of class society. They are all tools in one way or another of the ruling class or a wing of the ruling class or whatever it is. That semblance, that idea of an independent history of, or an independent existence of uh, democracy or the rule of law or justice is, uh, is what confuses a lot of people. It's very deliberately taught in that way. I studied law and that's deliberately how it was taught. Oh, if only we had proportional representation, everything would be better. It won't make any difference whatsoever. As if just slightly changing the, the mathematics of which MPs are elected into parliament, into a bourgeois parliament, will make any difference at all. Um, is obviously nonsense. Where those things do exist, in places like Germany, federalism, proportional representation, does it make any difference to the state being a weapon of the ruling class? Obviously not. Such arguments and discussions are complete distraction. They're just cosmetic nonsense of no interest really to communists. That's not to say, by the way, that we would never use the logic of democratic rights to, to undermine, just because we, un we can see the bourgeois state for what it is. We, can, we understand democracy for what it is. Democracy for the rich, democracy for the capitalist class. Doesn't mean we don't use the logic of democratic rights against the bourgeoisie. Doesn't mean I wouldn't say, for example, you, you say you're democratic. Well, why is it that we've got no, uh, no choice here at this election, for example? Why is it that we've got no say over foreign policy? I use the language of democracy, yeah, to undermine them and to prove my point that you have to, if you're talking about democracy, you have to say democracy for what class? You may even use institutions of the bourgeois state against the capitalists themselves. Trade unions sometimes, and sometimes they rely far too much on this, but sometimes it makes a lot of sense to use court cases, for example. When our comrades went into the police station, we didn't, we didn't say, well, we're not going to get them lawyers because lawyers are part of the bourgeois legal system. And we're not. No, obviously we did get them lawyers. And, uh, and we were going to use that as you know, Trotsky and Len, the Bolsheviks did that as well. They, they, they went in court, they went to court and they used the court to hurl these revolutionary speeches from the dock and, and make a big point about it. You can use these institutions of the bourgeois state as a platform. You could do, it, you could do the same thing in elections, for example, if you're big enough and strong. It's a tactical thing. It's not a principled thing. Oh, that's a bourgeois state and therefore we'll have nothing to do with it. No, you might use a court case or an election as a platform to get our ideas across. With no illusions, though, in the idea that you can actually cap that if we get elected or if you win a court case or whatever, or if you get a great lawyer, actually that will solve things as if, as if you can change things through the bourgeois legal system or through the bourgeois plan. That's not true. You can use it as a platform for getting our ideas out there. Mainly what we're interested in is class struggle methods, not, not the methods of the bourgeois uh, state. You can, for example, you can use the police uh, sorry, you can use the police. You can destroy the police. <laughs> you can destroy the police as a weapon of the ruling class by using class struggle methods. You can do it in a couple of different ways, potentially depending on the situation that you're faced with. In 1919 in Britain, there was a strike. The police went on strike. Same thing in Boston in the same year, I think, actually, in the US. And, uh, and obviously, in a, in a strike situation, you can split the ranks of the police. 
from the people at the top. That destroys the police as a weapon of the ruling class. They can't use that as a weapon of repression to, to defend their interests if it's split along class lines. Alternatively, as you saw in, um, in Minneapolis during the Black Lives Matter movement, they booted the police out of the city. They kicked them out entirely. That wasn't splitting the police along class lines. That was just kicking the whole lot of them out. And that was on the, on the basis of a mass movement of ordinary people, of working class people. Um, <clears throat> either way, uh, the, the police is destroyed as a, as a weapon of the ruling class. It's no longer able to carry out its function uh, of the ruling class. And that's thanks to the class struggle not thanks to capturing some position within the, within the bourgeois democratic state. Uh, the exact methods that you would use depends on the, on the, on the state of the class struggle at the, at, at the time. You'd say the same with the military. The military can be split along class lines as well. The ranks of the, of the military, the soldiers, they didn't go to the boarding schools that the generals went to. They're just ordinary working class people. And in, in um, where was it, in Syria during the Arab Spring, just over 10 years ago, for example, you did see that was one of many examples where the military has been split along class lines. The law, which is, as I say, just this formal expression of the status quo, that can also be um, rewritten by the class struggle, even in the space of a few days. 1972, five dockers were arrested in London and taken to Pentonville Prison on the basis of anti-trade union laws. That provoked a massive movement, a massive explosion of the class struggle, which was so powerful the government panicked, dug up a lawyer from somewhere who said, actually, do you know what? I've read the law, I've reread the law, and actually they haven't done anything wrong, uh, and they were immediately released. So it, it, that class struggle rewrote the law on the basis of the balance of, of class forces. The civil service is unionized by a very militant union, the PCS, a militant left-wing union. The civil, civil servants run the courts. They're the court staff in the courts. They run the, the, the tax office, HMRC. They can, uh, they can fully bring the government to a standstill. It's not the ministers who are collecting the taxes. It's the, it's the people in the, in the office, the workers in the offices who are in this militant union. Through class struggle methods, you could bring the government to its needs. That's what we're talking about. That's how you smash the bourgeois state. You don't, uh, you don't try and infiltrate and capture the dictatorship of the rich. You smash it using class struggle methods. Now, uh, there are a couple of other points that I would, I would like to have dealt with, uh, but I can't do it in any detail. So I'll make them telegraphically and then we can come back to them in the discussion if you like. Because the second, uh, the, or the second point of my three in the conclusion is, what do we replace the smashed bourgeois state with? Um, <clears throat> and obviously the answer is, is organs of working class struggle. In the course of smashing the state, in the course of class struggle, you would see strike committees thrown up, workers committees and so on. And what we would argue for is for those things to become new organs of state power. We're not trying to capture the existing state, we're trying to create new organs of state power. Not, from, not in the abstract, we haven't just sat here and dreamt something up, got a blueprint, this is exactly what it should look like. No, in the course of struggle, and I have many examples which I can't give now, but in the course of struggle, <coughs> these uh, state institutions would be, uh, would be, these new institutions of workers' power would be created. Um, <clears throat> I can come back to that perhaps a little bit more in the, in the summing up. Because my final uh, concluding remark is this, what, what is the task of communists now? Obviously, um, <clears throat> we are in favor of bourgeois democracy rather than dictatorship. But I don't want to give the impression that we think it's all the same. Uh, democracy, dictatorship, don't really care. That's not true. Bourgeois democracy is better than bourgeois dictatorship from the point of view of the working class, because it gives workers greater freedom to organize and to exchange ideas and so on. So we will defend even bourgeois democratic rights against, you know, we, we, will, we will say to Suella Braverman, it's a, it's a basic right for people to have the freedom of assembly. We won't just say, well, we don't care about freedom of assembly because it's a bourgeois right and we're not interested. That's, that's not how it works. Um, <clears throat> we are also, another reason we're in favor of bourgeois democracy is that it proves that formal democratic rights are not enough. That actually it levels the playing field. It says, well, everyone's got the right to vote. Everyone's got the right to speak, free press, freedom of assembly, freedom to have demonstrations and everything else. Um, and yet there is still terrible inequality and terrible oppression in society, which proves that formal bourgeois democracy is not enough. Actually, there is, there's something else that needs to be changed, a more fundamental change, a social revolution needs to take place, actually, and just fighting for for democratic rights is not enough. So we're in favor of bourgeois democracy insofar as it proves that point. Um, <clears throat> but yes, our, uh, our task here in this bourgeois democratic country 
is to expose, first of all, the hypocrisy of the ruling class, who call themselves democratic while cheerfully tramping, trampling on democratic rights, left, right, and center. And most importantly, is to combat the dangerous illusions of the liberals and the reformists who ask us to rely on international law, on judges and courts and elections to bourgeois parliaments and so on. They bleat about the defense of democracy and get worried about it and say, well, never mind everything else, never mind your socialism, never mind your communism. We, the main thing is we've got to defend democracy. We have to combat that kind of, uh, those kind of ideas. That's the main job of communists, I would say, is to promote class struggle methods, not the courts and the UN, class struggle methods to fight for the interests of working class people. And that means fighting for a socialist revolution.